Hi, everybody. This is Nina Boski and Gary Vitaco Robles. Mm -hmm, yes. And we are in a part two of a five part series of this week. We are talking about Marilyn Monroe mental illness and addiction, but specifically this week, we are talking about sexual and physical abuse, uh, not only around Marilyn's life, which we're going to get into in this segment, if you were able to pick up the first uh, part of this uh, segment or this series uh, for this week, we really got into the statistics and uh, what people are maybe dealing with and some of the challenges when uh, people are, are dealing with physical and sexual abuse. But this segment specifically, we're going to get into the life, the times, and not necessarily the movies in Marilyn Monroe or the films, but this is based on Gary Vitaco's Robles' book. Uh, and this is volume one, but she's got two volumes. Look at how thick this thing is, right? He's one of the most acclaimed biographers of Marilyn Monroe and its icon, the lifetimes and films of Marilyn Monroe volumes one and two. But Gary is also a mental health professional and he has a lot of experience in this area. Uh, when I'm not in, in the media, I am uh, my quote day job is a transformational life and business coach and media coach as well. But I deal with the transformational space. So he and I have joined forces this month for Mental Health Awareness Month to really bring a light not only to Marilyn's life, but to help those of you that may either be dealing with it yourself in terms of mental illness and addiction, sexual and physical uh, abuse and trauma like Marilyn, but to give you hope and inspiration that you too can go ahead and get some help. So let's get into it. Gary, my wealth of information. Let's talk about Marilyn because a lot of her biographies kind of gloss over this part of her life or kind of downplay it. And I don't know if it's people are a little bit in denial. They don't want to look at this glamorous celebrity as going through all this trauma. Maybe it brings up their own trauma. Who knows? But let's get into what actually happened to Marilyn in terms of her life experience around this very sensitive issue. Well, we, we really can't understand Marilyn Monroe unless we understand the context of her childhood uh, experience with what we call complex trauma. She was a very resilient woman who was able to survive uh, neglect, physical abuse, and sexual abuse early in her childhood during a time when these issues were not discussed. Mm. And... Unfortunately, uh, her legion of biographers, mostly of whom were men, um, minimized and even denied um, the sexual abuse. So you, you really can't tell this woman's story unless you come at it from this perspective because it, it provides you know, many um, explanations and backgrounds for the direction, the trajectory of her life and why it led to um, ultimately her, her very tragic uh, passing and all of the challenges that she, she struggled with. And um, many people are drawn to her because she en engenders this, this empathy and, and compassion. Um, she was able to talk about things, these things openly and make herself um, very vulnerable. And so, you know, people who are interested in Marilyn, they're moved by that. You know, they, they wish they could have been able to protect her. Um, they're maybe wounded themselves and deal, dealing with similar issues. So they're, they're drawn to her as kind of the public figure, figure spokesperson for, for what their struggles are. Well, so, and you uh, also think about, that I don't know what we're having a little bit of feedback there, but we also think about that back then, talking about it. You know, think about that time and that era. It was before even Father Knows Best and the Brady Bunch and all that. but. Back then, they were not talking about that. That was a hush-hush thing. And no, absolutely, absolutely. And, and we know that um, sexual abuse was happening as frequently then as it is now. But those those issues were taboo. The, um, the early part of the 20th century was still pretty much a Victorian perspective. The Kinsey reports didn't come out until the late 40s and the early 50s, and we didn't really start openly talking about sexuality probably until uh, you know what we consider the the sexual revolution when the birth control pill was released, but really during the, the women's era when, um, 
when uh, women were speaking out about the brutalities against not just women, but women and children, um, perpetrated primarily by males in our culture. And so uh, that is Marilyn Monroe's experience when she was a little girl named Norma Jean Baker, and she did not have many protective factors in her life because her mother suffered from mental illness and was a single mother, and um, Marilyn's father uh, abandoned the mother and denied her paternity. So um, Marilyn, who was then little Norma Jean Baker, was placed very early in a foster home by her mom, who worked, and another family by the name of the Bolanders cared for her during her first seven years, which is probably the longest amount of stability that she's had in terms of one placement for seven years, because then she goes on to multiple placements and, you know, probably over 15 places. Let, let's back up again, just a little bit. So she, her mother has mental illness. She doesn't really know her dad. So she comes into this earth with already a lack of foundation. But you said that she was with a family for seven years. And do you think that during those years she was really loved or was it tolerated? Well, that's, that's, that's a really a hard one to explain. And, and the best way I think to get to it is to look at, at how Marilyn wrote of that time. She did not feel close to the female figure in the home. Um, the female figure, interestingly, ha um, had, uh, she was hard of hearing. And so that made communication rather difficult. Mm. And, so, and so little Norma Jean felt a little bit safer with the husband, Albert, um, but he was uh, a mail carrier and he was away most of the time. So the, the, the woman, Ida, took care of other children. She was, a, she was actually a licensed foster home, but um, Gladys paid for uh, this woman to care for Norma Jean. So there were other children in the home, some of whom uh, uh, Ida adopted. So Norma Jean was, wasn't the chosen one. Mm. Um, and in the home, there was, there was a strict discipline and what Marilyn later described as, you know, physical abuse, really being beaten. So, you know, this is a home where all of her, uh, her basic needs are being met, but there's a lot of physical abuse, which in the day, you know, there were different laws about physical abuse, but, but it seems rather excessive. And, you know, Marilyn writes, writes about it. Now, Ma, when she's in her early 30s now, living in New York many years later, you know, she's looking back and still processing this abuse. She talks about, I will not be punished or be whipped or be threatened or not be loved or sent to hell to burn with bad people, feeling that I am bad or to be afraid of my gen genitals or ashamed. So, you know, the, the, the context of this environment is kind of a very strict religious um, background. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's a, a, a lot of black and white thinking. Um, music was frowned upon. Going to the movies wow. was frowned upon, um, and you know physical discipline was was uh, a main theme here. Um, and and Marilyn writes about Ida and this relationship with Ida, still struggling with this this woman who who physically abused her for a long period of time. Now, the experience of other children in the home, you know, might have been different, um, might not. Um, no one's uh, really to know, but later on when, when Norma Jean, um, Marilyn was Norma Jean as a child, I'm kind of flipping back and forth. <laughs> with me, but when she uh, lived in the um, orphanage, um, Ida was trying to um, have contact with her. And I'm not saying that Ida was a, a bad person. She brought many positive aspects to Norma Jean's life, but some of those aspects also included physical abuse. Norma Jean didn't want to see her, and the um, staff at the orphanage felt that she kind of regressed and became sad and anxious after visits from Ida. So um, there's a lot to be said about the impact of, of uh, physical abuse um, in the Bolander home for that period of time. It was also a period of time when her, um, her dog was killed. Oh. And, um, so she had a traumatic loss of a little dog named um, Tippy, who was rather kind of violently killed. We're not, there's various stories about how that happened. Um, uh, might have been killed by a neighbor, might have been hit by a, a car, but little, little Norma Jean came home to see the dog dead 
and Ida and Wayne with like a hoe and um, not quite sure if someone in the family even, you know, killed the dog. So that's on another level of context in this physical abuse in this household. So let me back up the truck here again. You've got uh, a, a child being born whose mother has mental illness, is unstable, and gives her to the foster home. She also, her dad, she doesn't know her dad. Ida, she has, back in the day, I, and I certainly, you know, a generation of the baby boomers, certainly and beyond, or before that, definitely grew up is... Children are designed to be seen but not heard. You have, you know, you have clothes, you have a roof over your head, you have something to eat, but they're certainly not concerned with your emotional well-being because we weren't dealing with that necessarily back in the day. But you're also introducing before the sexual abuse uh, a definite physical abuse that back then might not have been looked upon as physical abuse, but certainly today, when I talk about some of my grandmother's behavior, old school, you know, Croatian, uh, a woman, you know, she'd bring out the, 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 the twitch, she said the twitch, you know, and it's like, you know, that this, this was going to be, you know, part of your punishment. And, um, you know, that, that type of behavior back then was definitely accepted. Today, she would have probably, uh, been accused of child abuse. So that's, you know, that time. And then you introduce her dog, which is probably, you know, when you think about, you know, a man's best friend or a woman's best friend, in that case, a child, a young child who finally has something to love, it's her, her dog. And she sees her dog right there um, and, and sees the trauma of not necessarily the dog being killed, but the dog being dead. And, and I would imagine that given Ida's temperament, that she wasn't, oh, Marilyn or Norma Jean, come over here and let me give you a big hug. Yeah, not particularly a, a warm woman. Yeah. And um, probably the, the physical abuse, the, you know, that, that violation of um, adults reaching into this child's space and her, um, it, it could very likely have contributed to the sexual abuse that that happened later because her body was just being violated by you know so many people in so many different ways so any type of a violation kind of sets up the risk for um, a future violation how old was marilyn the first time she was sexually abused that you well, know she she, um, she, in her bi autobiography, she talks about being um, maybe about nine years old at the time. So I want to just put in context, this is Marilyn Monroe at nine years old. This is little Norma Jean. This is what she looked like. It kind of humanizes. This is an innocent little child who's been living in a foster home for about seven years. And her mother at this point is um, able to purchase a home, get a mortgage, and take Norma Jean to live with her in this home. So now Norma Jean leaves the Bolanders to live with a woman who, the mother, who came to visit her only on weekends, who wasn't particularly warm. She didn't have a particular attachment to this woman. And she was very frightened and she, she spent a lot of time, she writes, uh, in the closet hiding from Gladys and playing with toys. And because of Gladys's symptoms of schizophrenia, um, it was really hard for her to attach to this child and be emotionally available and present for her. So I think she really struggled and didn't quite know what to do with this little girl who was pretty much cared for by another family for so many years. Mm -hmm. And this was a tremendous responsibility on Gladys, who was working in the film industry as a negative splicer, and now having the responsibility of a child while her own mental illness is kind of exacerbating. So to survive with her, her child, um, Gladys, the mother, sublets the house to a couple in the film industry, or at least the entertainment industry, to help ends meet. Mm -hmm. And so now little Norma Jean, who was raised in this very strict uh, puritanical household, is now living um, with her mother uh, in a home where the boundaries are very different. These are entertainers subletting the house, and um, the boundaries are different. People are coming in and, and going and lots of visitors and drinking at night, um, music and dancing and all these kinds of things. And so this time frame seems to match uh, what Marilyn talks about as the first incident of her, her abuse. 
Um, Marilyn talks about it though, being in a home with a foster mother that she called an aunt who sublet a room to a man named Mr. Kimmel, I believe. And, um, and, and we really think she's protecting her mother because her mother was the one who had the tenant and um, it's probably not the aunt and the foster mom uh, or, or the foster mom called aunt, it's probably Gladys who, uh, where this happens. And so Marilyn writes about the, the man um, inviting her into his room and closing the door and locking it and telling her that she can't get out and then uh, her being very frightened and then him forcing himself upon her and then um, letting, letting her go after the abuse. And uh, Marilyn writes about going to the female caregiver in this placement and explaining very bravely what happened to her. And um, I, could, I could read you the, the quote. Yeah. yeah, read. I ran to my foster mother and told her what he did to me. She looked at me shocked, then slapped me across the mouth and shouted at me, I don't believe you. Don't dare say such good things about such a nice man. Mr. Kimmel then came up to me, handed me a nickel and said, go buy yourself some ice cream. Mm. I cried in bed that night and wanted to die. Uh, that makes so me want to cry. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I mean, you know, protective factors for children who are abused. I mean, they can heal. They can be resilient. Mm. You know, when the, the adults in their lives give them emotionally and developmentally what they need. And so this doesn't do this. This just shuts everything down. And um, if this indeed was her mother, um, if that just kind of, makes the situation worse where her mom couldn't protect her. Now, when we look, when we look back, you know, the mother, this is not an excuse, but the mother was financially dependent probably of, uh, on this family. And that might've been one of the reasons there might've been other reasons as well, why Gladys responded in this um, very negative way. Yeah. You know, you hear that with stories where uh, family members come forward and, you know, they're already, taking it's such a, a brave act to come forward and finally tell somebody your truth and to be shut down like that it's it's got to be extremely damaging especially with the fragmentation that she's already uh, had experienced i mean it, it, you know the first seven years of her life were unbelievably challenging and then you look at nine years old this on top of everything else so, and, so, and so the offender isn't ejected from the house. What happens is Norma Jean is physically punished. So her body is violated again, and she's kind of held responsible for making up this lie and disbelieved. And so, um, you know, there's, there's no focus on the fact that, that someone victimized her. Um, it really is, it really is horrible. So she's feeling very responsible and, and maybe even guilty. Um, certainly not protected. And, you know, if we look back to Gladys's history, um, Gladys's mother, uh, uh, Marilyn's grandmother, Della, um, brought a lot of um, men um, into um, Gladys's life. And um, um, Della was working, I think, at Santa Monica Pier uh, with, a, with an older man, an adult, younger than she, but certainly older than her daughter Gladys at the time. Gladys would have been a teenager. And uh, Gladys winds up marrying this older man who worked with her mother. And um, she was pregnant at the time that she was married and she was still a teenager. Mm -hmm. So we know that Della's relationship with this uh, employer uh, brought uh, him into the life of Gladys. There was clearly um, an age difference between them, which resulted in a pregnancy and, and marriage. So we're not quite sure how Della, or, or rather how Gladys would have even perceived um, sexual abuse, given all of her challenges. Yeah, we talked about this in the last segment of being intergenerational as well. Do we know, Gary, if this was a one-off incident, incident, or did it keep happening, given the fact that, you know, Obviously, the guy was still there. They just said, here, go ahead. I mean, do we know anything more? Did it keep? Because that would even be worse. So she goes forward. She gets denied, shut down, and then it keeps happening. Yeah, I, th I think Marilyn sanitized this in her autobiography. I mean, it, this was kind of shocking information for the 50s. I, I don't think she told the whole story. But, but she told her personal friends that the abuse uh, by the male tenant in the house 
went on um, for a long period of time, many months and happened nearly every day. And wow. to exacerbate things, yes, it does get worse. You know, Gladys then had her psychiatric break while she was home with Norma Jean. So she was decompensating and probably acting in ways that would have been very frightening to a child who was already hiding in a closet and who had already been physically abused and sexually abused. And so now Norma Jean witnesses her mother um, having the psychotic break and being kind of dragged off by the authorities and placed in um, a state mm -hmm. hospital. And so she remained in the home with the tenants for a period of time um, with no protection from any birth family. Wow. Um, uh, her grandmother, Della, had already died um, shortly after her birth uh, in a, a state institution. Um, she was mentally ill as well. So, so there is you know, great likelihood that the abuse went on for a, a very long period of time. Um, and then it, it, it all came to the attention of Gladys's best friend, Grace Goddard, mm. who worked with her in the film industry. And um, some mistreatment came to Gladys's attention. And we don't know what mistreatment uh, really meant back then, if that was a euphemism for maybe Gladys clearly understanding what was happening to Norma Jean. But Norm, uh, Gladys then pulls her out of that, that home and um, becomes her guardian. And then there's multiple placements that lead to an, a placement in an orphanage for a period of time. And while um, Norma Jean is in the orphanage, you know, she knows that she's not an orphan. She knows that her mother is alive, somewhere institutionalized, and um, she's placed there, and, Gla and Grace promises to visit her, but um, she can't get away to see the child. And so Norma Jean goes through some serious depression at, at the orphanage, which is very well documented by the superintendent um, at the time. Uh, in records that are available. And can you blame her? I mean, seriously, you know, when you, when you put it in the context of how we're talking about this, and now you start looking at, now she's in an orphanage. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be, I mean, the fact that she lived as long as she lived is amazing. Oh, she was she was incredibly, incredibly resist, re resilient and strong, with without doubt. So she's staring out the window of of the orphanage, and I've I've been to the orphanage before. I've looked out the second story window, and I saw the the water tower um, on the Paramount lot that little Norma Jean would look out to, and she would fantasize about becoming a movie star because if she became this desirable movie star, then maybe her father would come claim her and rescue her. So this was her fantasy that her dad, this man would, would suddenly take interest in her and want to pull her away from this grim reality of her life. And so that she felt the only the way that she can do that was to become somehow important to catch mm -hmm. his attention. Yeah. She became very depressed. And so at some point, um, Grace Goddard does um, show up uh, but now she's partnered with a man, Doc Irwin Goddard. And unfortunately, um, Doc had a serious alcohol problem. So um, Grace and, and Doc Goddard start taking care of Norma Jean. And this is kind of what age she would have been at the time, maybe around um, 12 years old or so, 11, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, one night, um, Doc is intoxicated and stumbles into her bedroom and comes into her bed and forces himself upon her. Oh. So now we have um, another adult male offender who's supposed to be a protective father figure in, in this instance and, and who is not. And um, what happens? Um, Grace doesn't eject him from the home. She ejects Norma Jean from the home. Oh my gosh. You look at that. I mean, that is just... You know, for people that only know just a little bit about Marilyn, I mean, this is this is such texture, and, and it and it creates the fabric of her life. I mean, this is you know, people will just go, oh, she was this or she was that, but you know, what what trauma to experience, and now we're at you know round two of a different man that we know of. That we know of certainly. Um, and so where, where, where does she go live at this point? So she, um, she does have an, um, an aunt through marriage. So her mother's brother was Marion uh, Monroe. 
And uh, Marion most likely had a mental illness like his sister Gladys, like their, their mother um, Della, like their uh, grandfather Tilford who um, took his own life. And so um, the, the uncle kind of took off and left his wife Olive and their three children living with um, Olive's mother. And so um, Grace thought that, you know, it might be uh, appropriate now to, to place Norma Jean with at least someone connected to her blood family. So um, Olive is living in poverty because her husband has taken off and, and there's no real income coming in and she's trying to raise her children in the depression. And so this is the home where you hear that, that Norma Jean had to bathe in the dirty bathwater of all the other folks who came before, just due to the intense uh, poverty. And um, there is an, a, a cousin, an older cousin, maybe 13 years old in the home, who now sexually assaults her. And um, Ida May, who was one of the other cousins living there who shared the bed with Norma Jean, um, re recalled to at least one of the biographers, uh, Donald Spoto, that um, little Norma Jean um, uh, would bathe obsessively um, every night, whether the water was clean or uh, unclean, because she just felt so um, violated by the sexual assault. And, and she would talk to the other cousins about, you know, wanting to become a school teacher and wanting to take care of lots of dogs and never wanting to get married. So it's very clear in that statement that she knew that she had to take care of herself. Uh, males weren't to be trusted. And vulnerable dogs, I think, were just um, representations of, of her as vulnerable. Now she wanted to protect these other vulnerable creatures. And so this is around the age that um, this happens in, in North Hollywood. And in, 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 uh, roughly about around the time of her 12th birthday. So these, these photographs are kind of a, approximate. Wow. So... Does the abuse continue after 12 or does it start to subside? Um, it, it does seem to subside. I mean, James um, Doherty was uh, her first husband who um, corresponded with me in, in the last years of, of his life. And he was the one who um, communicated with me about the um, abuse that took place in um, her uh, aunt's home and, and Doc Goddard as well. So she, she married um, James Doherty when she was uh, 16. It was an arranged marriage by Grace Goddard and um, uh, Jim's mother um, because they, they knew that, that Norma Jean would probably be sent back to a fort, an orphanage because there wasn't really a placement for her when Grace and her mm -hmm. husband were were moving um, to West Virginia. I'm um, probably the safest person, the healthiest person to come into Norma Jean's life at this time was um, Grace's aunt, Anna Lauer, who was a, an elderly uh, widow um, who br brought great stability and love uh, to Norma Jean. Um, and, and Norma Jean lived with her on and off as well as many, many other people during this time frame. She kind of bounced around and, and in some instances she, in, in the course of the school year, she would be in three different placements. So if you could imagine being in a placement, maybe um, the beginning of the school year and then at, at winter break, then you're in another placement until spring break and then you're in another placement for the end of the school year and into the summer. I mean, it's really hard to establish healthy connections and attachments with people when you've experienced all this complex trauma and you don't have any stability. And Gary, so, Gary, could you imagine around? just going through the school year and breaking it up as a child? How traumatic that is. It's hard enough to, to try to gain friends, etc. when you're there. Then you look at being born to a mother who has mental illness and who is unstable, not having a father, going to this, to this, you know, first seven years of, of, of being physically abused, being on the outside, not being the chosen one, at nine years old, being sexually abused, we, as we know for the first time, right? And then coming forward, having enough bravery to come forward and tell somebody, then to get slapped, have the, the abuser be able to stay there and have it continue to happen, then to be put into another uh, situation where another man has now violate, violated her, and then to be kind of like given to 
because there's nobody else that can have her, so to speak, that they are now marrying her off. And it's unbelievable. And then what you just said about that she's bouncing around with all these different schools. I mean, it's unbelievable. What an unbelievable, tenacious spirit she has, you know, as a, as a coach, I'm always talking about, you know, visual, visualizing your future. She is the queen of being able to vision, envision something for our future and actually attain it. Given she dreams of a way out. She the really did. Through the entertainment industry, which is not easy to break into. So when yeah. you think of the chances of breaking in and you think of how she visualized, this is her way to escape as a young woman who was uneducated in, in the post-war era. Um, uh, and she, she made it happen through hard work. And I think that's even minimized as well. You know, oftentimes um, she's not given the credit for her hard work and talent um, that, that it took that... Uh, a lot of men are given credit for discovering her and for, for her career, which I, uh, I think that is a direct result of her own work and her own accomplishment. There's something I wanna read though about what she thinks about her life at this time. She talks about the world was grim. I wasn't used to being happy. So it was something I never took for granted. I wanted more than anything in the world to be loved. Love to me then and now means being wanted. The world around me just crumbled. It seemed that nobody wanted me. When, when a child is placed in multiple placements and those, that doesn't result uh, in a permanent placement for whatever reason, you know, there's many reasons why and maybe appropriate reasons, but you know, for the child, she just feels, I, went to, I wasn't chosen, I wasn't loved, I wasn't good enough, I wasn't worthy. That's how the child reads it. Yeah. But then she hits puberty. And um, this is also around the time that the sexual abuse is going on, but, but um, she writes, when I was 11, the whole world was closed to me. I just felt I was on the outside of the world. But then suddenly, everything opened up. The world became friendly. And what she really is talking about is that as she began to, began to develop as a pubescent female, she was attracting a lot of attention of older males and men. And that's what she was seeing as friendly. So, so this is kind of an unhealthy uh, friendly you know, this, this was not the attention she really craved or needed. This was kind of a sexualized uh, attention, um, which could be dangerous to her safety. Wow, that's a whole other subject in terms of what she then created is, is regards to her caricature, Marilyn Monroe, which really wasn't her. But interesting that it has this, it took on a very sexual component to it in terms of being one of the most, uh, you know, sexiest and, and well, uh, you know, every man wanted her, right? You know, at that time, you know, of creating this that. Based upon her, her history of, of childhood sexual abuse, and, you know, yeah. the, the focus on sexuality and, and, and being desired in, in that sense. And when you look at the character she created on screen, it's kind of a, a, a developmentally, almost emotionally arrested um, female because she's, she's very childlike. And while on screen, that's very delightful and it's endearing and it's innocent and it's wonderful. It's also where her development kind of stalled mm -hmm. um, and it's blending um, the sexuality and, and, and childhood at the same time, yeah. which becomes very disturbing in, in a way. But um, when you look at the character, Laura Lai Lee and Gentleman for Fur Buns, she's, she's very smart, and, um, but she's very kind of innocent and, and childlike with a lot mm -hmm. of naivete. And in a way, that's also Marilyn's strength. You know, she never became like bitter and um, hardened. She was always able to maintain kind of that innocence, that childlike quality about her, the openness, the wistfulness, um, which is so much, that says so much about her, her spirit and her soul that she allowed mm -hmm. herself to be um, childlike um, when so many others of us would have become very, angry, cold, and embittered. You know, so many of us, uh, you know, there's all these reasons why we're attracted to Marilyn Monroe, whether it's her, you know, sexuality, her glamour, her beauty, being that one of the most famous movie stars of the time, right? But there's also that, and also the, the controversy around her death gets a lot of, uh, of attention, but I would say, you know, being in this space now for almost seven years and you for a lot longer, that it really is her vulnerability and her ability to show up and be real 
even though she kind of segregated herself between Norma Jean and Marilyn Monroe. It's that vulnerability, that ability, that childlike quality that we see in children that makes us want to open up to them because there's that authentic self that, especially as a movie star, not only then, but today, that realness is, you know, many times just a facade. And with her, she she always, you know, in when she came forward, kept that sense of her of herself. It would it would come through and we'd still we'd still get it, even if she was in her Marilyn Monroe persona. So mm -hmm. uh, let's and children children were very drawn to her. You know, she became and animals. Child like herself and animals. She she had really wonderful relationships with the children of, um, of of her friends, and many of them have gone on to talk about just how wonderful she was uh, mm. to them and how connected they felt to her um, as an adult. Which uh, where they maybe they couldn't feel that connected to other adults because they related to her in in um, in a different way. And uh, at the end of this month, we'll be uh, we'll be doing a little segment around uh, Marilyn's birthday is on June first. And uh, how old would she be this year? As it she was born in twenty six. So if my math is 93? correct, I think she'll be ninety three. Ninety three. So she would have been ninety three. So and there's no reason to believe that she would still be alive because her half sister Bernice is turning one hundred in July. She was born wow. in nineteen eighteen. Wow. My understanding is that she is alive and well, um, somewhere in the South. I won't say where, but she's somewhere in the South. So um, happy well, 100. a big 100 to Bernice and has been very uh, quiet all these years for the most part around Marilyn. And I'm sure uh, it hasn't been easy for, for somebody like herself that, uh, you know, there's so many fans out there that just, you know, want more and more and more and more. But let's finish up this segment for right now and let's pick up our next, our third part of this segment in our five part series around Marilyn. We've been talking about her physical and sexual abuse. I know this is not an easy segment for, for those of you that love her dearly to to witness and to hear. I know for me, it was it was not easy to, to listen to this. But I think that to understand Marilyn and to understand her full and entire life, um, let's not gloss over these issues because glossing over these issues does not get us anywhere, whether it's Marilyn Monroe or your own life or your loved ones. So uh, join us for our next segment where we're gonna talk about what you can do if you yourself have experienced this type of trauma or you may be concerned about somebody that may be going through it what are the signs that you can look for and then where can you get help and the resources and the support and uh, that i think in terms of Marilyn's legacy would be something that she would stand behind and let's use and you've heard us say this in the goodnight Marilyn radio show where this all got started is let's turn her tragedy into a transformation and use her legacy for something good we'll be back in just a moment